After re-establishing themselves once again as the top dogs of English football in 1985, Everton suffered double disappointment the following season when, despite a 40 goals contribution from Gary Lineker, the team finished runners-up in both the Championship race and the FA Cup final. And to add insult to injury, both competitions had been won by Liverpool. It had been a bitter pill to swallow, and after the top scoring in the 1986 World Cup in Mexico, Lineker decided to further his career in sunnier climbs than Merseyside. Barcelona came knocking, and Lineker answered the call. As well as losing his leading marksman, Howard Kendall was also without the world's best goalkeeper. Neville Southall had picked up an ankle injury in March 1986 that ended his season, and he was nowhere near ready for a recall when the new campaign kicked off. Thankfully, though, Bobby Mims had already proved himself to be a more than able deputy. Also, on the long-term injury list on the day were Gary Stevens, Paul Bracewell and Peter Reid. On the credit side, Kendall had recruited a big centre-half who'd actually begun his career across Stanley Park with Liverpool. Dave Watson had moved to Norwich City to establish himself as a professional footballer. And for a fee of almost a million pounds, Kendall brought him back to his home city. There was a lot of rumours going about in the papers that Everton were interested and then I actually got a phone call off, off Howard Kendall, you know, saying he was very interested in signing me. Um, and he has an agreement with Ken, Ken Brown, the Norwich manager, if a big club ever came in for me, they'd give me a chance to talk to them. Both clubs obviously got together, done a bit of negotiating and um, come to a fee of £900,000, which was a hell of a lot of money in them days. Watson was already an England international, but there were a few raised eyebrows at one of Kendall's other summer purchases. Paul Power had been a one-club man for many years at Manchester City. It was something of a surprise when he was lured down the M62 to Goodison. But Kendall was desperate for defensive cover, and the likeable Mancunian proved to be a superb signing, even if the initial contact didn't threaten to ruin a family holiday. My wife had just had a baby and we, uh, we didn't go abroad that year. We went to a place um, in Devon called Saunton Sands and uh, there was, a, there was a, a message on the, uh, on the room phone uh, to get in touch with Jimmy Frizzell, who was the assistant manager at City at the time. I'd just signed a contract at Manchester City for another year and uh, he said that Howard Kendall had phoned up and uh, would I give him a ring. So, so I rang Howard straight away and he said he wanted to sign me. Um, but it was the first time I'd been away on holiday. I didn't want to break the holiday off, so I asked him would he mind if, uh, if I left it until the Friday. Uh, and then I went down to see him on the Friday. Um, I, actually, I actually signed on the same day as Neil Adams, so we went and had our um, medicals at the same time uh, with Doc Irvin. And, uh, and that was it, done in, in really uh, short shrift, really. You know, I, I mean, I thought I was going down to chat to him, um, have a medical wait, mull it over, but you know, the whole thing was concluded within uh, a couple of hours. Winger Neil Adams joined from Stoke City and young Wigan Athletic midfielder Kevin Langley was drafted in. Both made their debuts in the Charity Shield at Wembley against Liverpool in August. Sharp the target. And Sharp and Heath will take it on. And Heath will score for Everton. Well, the strike partnership comes good for Everton. Heath beating Hooper. Consummate finish. Not the most memorable of Merseyside derbies, except for Neil Adams, but not for the right reasons. It still makes Graham Sharp smile, though. He first appears for Everton would have been at Wembley, uh, and I think he was delighted to actually come on the pitch, but shortly after he came on as a sub and shortly after he got taken off again because he, he didn't obey instructions uh, from Howard, and uh, he, got, he got taken off, so the, the boy was absolutely shell-shocked after you know, what would have been the most enjoyable time of his career, you know, playing at Wembley and thinking, yeah, I'm going to make a, an impression here. I think it was at 10, 12 minutes later he was getting hooked off again. I think it's the only time I've actually seen that happen. Uh, so I felt a little bit uh, sorry for them, but it stood them in good stead. Watson, Power and Langley all made their Goodison debuts on the opening day against Nottingham Forest. But it was an old hand, Kevin Sheedy, who proved to be the match winner. Harper. Now Stephen. He's got away from Pierce well. Langley's header, Sheedy! 
It was just too hot to handle. Langley's knocked down, Sheedy's volley, 1-0 Everton. Langley. Cross comes in, he's beaten Fleming, Sheedy! The trusty left foot comes good again. Beat Fleming's jump, and Sheedy's finished superb. Kevin Sheedy off to a flyer. The quietly spoken Irishman was a regular and very important contributor to the Everton 1980s story. He was always taking the mickey sheet in a quiet type of way, but an absolute a brilliant footballer. He was one that had a left foot and used to say he could open the canopies, you know. And he must have created so many goals, as well as the goals he scored, he must have created a tremendous amount of goals. I'd love to know his record of assists, you know. Um, we obviously know the goals he scored, but he was, um, he was a brilliant player. After a promising start to the new campaign, Everton were then held to two consecutive away draws. Kevin Langley's first goal for the club and one from Graham Sharp and a 2-2 draw at Hillsborough against Sheffield Wednesday. A young scouser Ian Marshall found the net in a 1-1 draw at Coventry City. Kevin Langley had really adapted well to top flight football and he'd already impressed his new teammates. He came in and we saw the quality he had in, in training and uh, when he got his opportunity then he, did, he took his chance and did really well for us that season. Uh, he had ability and playing with better players obviously brought the best out of him and certainly took that into the games and was a big part of our success. Sixth position in the first published league table signified a solid if unspectacular start to the new season for the Blues but that was just what Howard Kendall had asked for. Stability was the name of the game, with so many senior players sidelined with injury, the manager knew that anything achieved this season would need to be very much a squad effort. Look at Manchester United, by the way. Three games and three defeats under big Ron Atkinson. Kevin Langley continued to take the huge step up in class like a duck to water, showing a maturity way beyond his years. He slotted well into the Everton midfield and showed that, as well as endless energy, he also had an eye for goal when Oxford United came to Goodison Park. Wouldn't quite reach Aldridge. Now, oh, Heath could be away here. Brought down by Judge, and that will be a penalty. Well, Alan Judge engaging in semantics, but it won't put Trevor Stephen off. Everton in front. Trevor Stevens scoring from the penalty spot. Power into the box. It's away by Charles. Houghton was beaten to it there. Steven making progress. Harper! Oh, brilliant goal! A rare goal for Alan Harper. But it's certainly a special one. And Everton are back in front. Adams will get the cross in. And Briggs able to guide it behind before it reached Graham Sharp. Well, eight minutes left in the game. Langley's waiting in there. Watson is up as well. Briggs will get up there, it's Langley's shot, and that will wrap it up for Everton. 3-1, Kevin Langley's first goal at Goodison. A comprehensive win, and Langley was looking like an inspired signing. Howard just saw him as a squad player, I think he paid 120000 to Wigan for him, and brought him in. No expectation really that he would make any real immediate mark on the first team. But again, because of circumstances, that season, you know, the Everton squad was really ravaged. And we ended up for long spells with players who weren't penciled in to do that job, doing jobs. 
And Kevin was great. He was terrific. He came in and he played a whole load of games consecutively. Came from nowhere, played all those games, got a championship medal and then all but disappeared again. The next Goodison game was against Queen's Park Rangers and a wholly forgettable affair ending goalless. Mid-September saw Everton's first ever visit to Plough Lane. The Wimbledon story was an incredible journey from non-league football all the way through to the top flight in 10 years. And they had, under the colourful Dave Bassett, adapted to life in the first division rather well. Plough Lane was just about the most intimidating venue in the division and Everton were made to work hard for a most welcoming 2-1 win courtesy of Sheedy and Sharp. Kendall had to shuffle his defensive pack for the visit of Manchester United, with the fit again Derek Mountfield playing as an emergency right back in the absence of the injured Alan Harper. It was a wonderful display by the Blues. Once again, they were more than a match for United. Well, who can find the opening? Sheedy, it's a terrific cross, it's Sharp! What a fantastic goal! All about the cross from Sheedy, but Sharp with the finish, matched it. Sheedy back in there once more. Sieberbeck makes the block. All over the place, Whiteside in trouble. And somehow behind by a combination of Sieverbeck and Turner. Adrian Heath with the effort. But the pressure mounting on the Manchester United goal. They found themselves level, but Everton have responded in the right way. Well, there's the flick. And there's the shot from Sheedy. And with his right foot, puts Everton back in front. bit of tiredness creeping into the United performance. Sharp knocking it on. And also chased down Moran. That's Langley who's well forward here. Heath in the middle. That's a terrific goal. Adrian Heath ties it up for Everton. Langley's cute delivery and Heath stoops to conquer. Manchester United well and truly put to the sword and that's an afternoon that Kevin Sheedy can remember clearly. I can indeed, I scored a right footy goal from a corner so uh, managed to go on to the end of a flick on. Um, but no, we were playing full of confidence that day and um, you know we sort of steamrolled them 3-1 and um, you know it was boosted our confidence as well to, to get a comfortable victory over, over Man United so it was a you know, good victory along the way. The League Cup campaign got off to a comfortable start with the second round first leg win over Newport County at Goodison. The 4-0 scoreline just about tells the story. So far, so good for Kendall's men, but the unbeaten league record was always going to be severely tested at White Hart Lane at the end of September. And on the day, Tottenham Hotspur proved to be just too strong. Danny Thomas involved, there was Hoddle. Paul Allen. An enterprising starts. And guided behind by Mountfield in the end. Waddle. Good play from Spurs and Allen. Here's Allen. All problems here. Oh, terrific save by Mims. Denies Paul Allen. And Allen! Hoddle. Allen. Hat trick hunting. But not. Patrick Geddick. Sitting nicely in third place behind Nottingham Forest and Norwich City, with just one setback so far, Everton were building a nice, solid platform. One concern, though, was the indifferent form of Dave Watson. The defender replaced fans' favourite Derek Mountfield, and he was struggling to gain the affections of the Goodison faithful. Yeah, I mean, I was abroad uh, on the pre-season tour. Uh, and Howard was in desperate search of a centre and he picked Dave Watson. Several clubs wanted Dave Watson. He was the obvious choice. And he just pulled me over breakfast one morning. He said, uh, go let Dave Watson get a message to him that we might be interested. And of course, this is the days before the internet and mobile phones. And I'm, I'm in a 
phone box in the middle of the Austrian Alps <laughs> trying to get through to Norwich City and Dave Watson. Uh, but the message got through and it got him, but he was desperate to get Dave Watson. Uh, and I think Howard realised if he didn't move sharpish, then somebody else would take him. Uh, and the funny thing of course, about Dave Watson is that he's now, you know, rightly lauded as an Everton hero. But a lot of people forget that he had a really rough time when he started with Everton. Start of that season, uh, the, the, the supporters just didn't really take to him for some reason. Maybe he's Liverpool background, I don't know. But, and I think after two months, Howard left him out because of the pressure he was under. But I mean, Dave being Dave, you know, he just had the character to come back and prove everybody, well, prove the, f the few doubters wrong. Uh, and you look back, I think it was £900,000, but uh, massive key signing. I mean, I was taking over from Derek Mountfield, and Derek was obviously a big hero up here, and he'd done magnificent for the club, scored great goals, and all of a sudden I've been thrown in there, um, an ex Liverpool player. So, I mean, the crowds were on me back straight away. Um, but I wasn't playing well. I don't know what it was, whether it was the £900,000 price tag. Um, I really don't know what it was, but I did, I did have a nightmare when I first came to Everton, yeah. October got off to a disappointing start with the visit of Arsenal to Goodison Park. A Paul Wilkinson hat-trick was the highlight of a 5-1 win at Newport County, which gave the Toffees a 9-1 aggregate passage into the third round of the League Cup. But when league duties were resumed, the capital jinx struck again. The defeat by the odd goal in five at Charlton was the third consecutive setback against a London team. Trevor Stephen had started the campaign well for Everton and his ability to score goals as well as create goals was to prove pivotal as the season progressed. He was on the mark in a much needed 2-0 win at Southampton with Paul Wilkinson also on target. Since arriving on the first division scene at Watford had traditionally made entertaining opponents for Everton and their trip north on October the 25th was no exception. And to add a bit of spice, it was the first appearance of the season for Neville Southall. Trevor Stephen to take the corner then. And sharp up there. Oh, Terry lost it. Mountfield. Derek Mountfield opens the scoring. Well, Everton rather stung by that equaliser. Power. Heath. To power. Oh, that'll be a penalty. Well, Stephen against Sherwood. And Everton retake the lead from Stephen's retaken penalty. Ratcliffe. Steve Sims under it for Watford. Harper. Oh, and it's Mountfield! Oh. Well, his second of the game for Everton, his third overall, and he atones for his earlier disappointment. So, a winning return for Neville Southall, and although Bobby Mims was a more than competent deputy, there was no doubt who was the goodest and number one. He was absolutely fantastic. He tried everybody every minute of the day. Um, coaches, medical staff, the woman in the, the kitchen, the laundry people. He tried everybody on because he was always tormenting people, Neville. He was, that was his role in life, I think. Apart from being the greatest goalkeeper we've seen for a long time. And he was, um, he was some character. And he needed attention all the time because he wanted to work all the time, you know. It was the type of fella that he was. In the League Cup, Everton just couldn't stop scoring, and it was a competition that Paul Wilkinson clearly enjoyed playing in. Next on his radar was Sheffield Wednesday. Rashidi's corner. Oh. Now Martin Hodge under real pressure there. Paul Wilkinson certainly not frightened to put himself about. And Rashidi will get another opportunity here. There she goes, Wilkinson in there! Off the line by Worthington, but it's given. Well, Nigel Worthington is absolutely furious, but Paul Wilkinson will be credited with a goal. This comes in from power. It's Madden away. It's Heath. Oh, special. A fabulous goal by Heath. 
and Everton, two in front inside 11 minutes. Harper will cross it in. And he'll drop for Mountfield here, and Mountfield will put it beyond any doubt at all. Sharp. Now Sheedy. Oh, and Wilkinson coming in. A terrific Everton goal to cap a terrific Everton performance. The fourth round beckons. At the end of October, just four points separated the top eight sides. Everton had weathered the storm of three consecutive defeats. A massive bonus for Howard Kendall was the fact that Paul Power had made himself an automatic selection, which hadn't quite been the manager's plan when the experienced defender was originally drafted in. He honestly said to me, um, you know, you, you're probably going to be here as a, as a squad player. Um, you know, I, I was quite happy to take that chance because I knew that it was an opportunity to, uh, to play with some uh, tremendous individual players now. Um, you know, I knew that there was a problem with uh, Pat Vanden House injury. So I thought, well, you know, there's, a, there's an opportunity for me to start. If I, if I start and do well, you know, it might be difficult for him to leave me out. And, and that, was the, that was always the aim. The London jinx was still in evidence when a trip to Upton Park to take on West Ham United at the beginning of November ended in a single goal defeat. But the capital rot stopped when Kevin Sheedy and Trevor Stephen were on the score sheet against Chelsea in a match that ended all square at Goodison Park. Chelsea defending with their lives at the moment. Heath's really buzzing now, is that handball? It was, and that'll be a penalty to Everton. Stephen scores, never a doubt. Next up, a trip to Filbert Street, and a 2-0 victory there was earned by Heath and Sheedy, both of whom were on the score sheet again when the remarkable scoring in the League Cup continued. Norwich City were beaten 4-1 at Carrow Road. That was 17 goals in just four League Cup ties for Everton. Here's Neil Adams. To Sheedy. And Everton take the lead. Oh, Gordon. Trying to get it in there. Oh, it's Phillips. Norwich City on terms. Reckliff's free kick, Mountfield's flick, Sharp, scores. Norwich want the flag. Reckliff. And Heath is brought down. Stephen from the spot then. 3-1. it's Graham Sharp on the break here for Everton. Heath bursting up in the middle. He's got to make it four. And eventually does. The first Merseyside derby of the season ended goalless on an afternoon that proved to be Kevin Langley's last appearance in an Everton shirt. After a great start, the youngster had faded and was never to force his way back in. Um, sometimes it happens, you know, you go in and you're on a high, as you say, you scored a couple of early goals, um, really confidence, and probably it hit home to him the, the enormity of the club he was playing for, and probably, you know, it, it just knocked him back a little bit. But um, as I say, he contributed immensely to the success that season. The last game of November provided Paul Power with his first return to Main Road, and with typically perfect timing, he took the opportunity to notch his first goal for Everton. That's a good ball to set Adams away. The keeper in no man's land, and Heath will score. Well, the keeper didn't know whether to stick or twist. Sheedy, it's a good ball for Sharp. And now it's Paul Power up here, and Paul Power has scored on his return to Main Road. 
Well, delight for Kendall and Harvey on the bench. And Paul Power returns to the club he served so well. With a goal. Now. An opportunity here, sharp to Heath. He's got to wrap it up. And that is exactly what Adrian Heath has done. And who needs Gary Lineker? And you've got a striker in form like Adrian Heath. And Graham Sharp for that matter. And he finished it expertly once more. A Paul Power goal against Manchester City was just the sort of fairy tale that football produces from time to time. Although after Kendall had pushed the player further forward into midfield, a goal against his former club was perhaps inevitable. I suppose it was, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, Howard said, uh, I want you to play further up the pitch. Uh, nice to score, it was always good to score, but difficult to, to be running around in front of players that I'd played with the season before, the likes of Mick McCarthy and Kenny Clements and Neil McNabb and people like that. So uh, I just sort of quietly turned around and enjoyed it uh, sort of uh, with him, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I think uh, we went to Main Road as it was then, and I think we won 3-1, crucial win. And astonishingly, Paul Power scored in that game. And it was like the classic sort of Dennis Law situation where he scored and he didn't quite know what to do because he'd been at Main Road for so long before coming over here. And he didn't celebrate. He literally just knocked the ball in, turned around and walked back the halfway line. And I know Howard, I was talking to Howard Kendall two days later, he said, I tore him to shreds in the dressing room. I said, you play for Everton now. You score for this great club. You celebrate properly. But Howard just, you know, he's just underlining that, you know, yeah, you played for Man City and you love Man City, but this is Everton. And if you score for this club, you celebrate. Just two league wins in November left Everton in fourth in the table, five points behind the leaders Arsenal, and just as significantly for the supporters, two behind Liverpool. In the continued absence of European football for all English clubs, the powers that be had introduced an extra competition. The full Members' Cup wasn't popular with Everton supporters, who viewed the games as little more than friendlies. But at least the visit of Newcastle at the beginning of December was a night of personal triumph for Graham Sharp. Sheedy with a shot! Oh, that's a terrific goal. Well, he just never disappoints. Sharp trying to work his way through. He'll find Adams. And that's not a bad cross, and that's not a bad header. And Everton have got another goal. And it's Graham Sharp who scores it. Sheedy. Paul Power. Sheedy again. Stephen. Power. Sheedy. It's a terrific move, and Sharp can finish it off. Newcastle United sliced apart by a wonderful, crisp Everton move. Everton knocking the ball about with increasing confidence. Ratcliffe taking the long route, which might be a profitable one. Heath is brought down by Thomas. And Newcastle's woe being compounded here. And Trevor Stephen wants to take it, but Graham Sharp on a hat trick is being ushered forth by the Gladys Street. And Graham Sharp completes his first hat trick in Everton colours. And it's turning into a rout. He's not even reached half time. Stephen. Oh, and Heath looking to get away. 
And it's touched back for Heath. A resounding win for Everton. A first Everton hat-trick then for Graham Sharp. The campaign didn't prove to be his most prolific, but there was still no doubting his immense quality. They talk about the great number nines at Everton and he, he was certainly one of, one of them. And um, a tremendous player. A fairly quiet lad, Sharpy, I found him. But a really, really good player who'd come through the ranks after coming down from Scotland. who played reserve team football for a while with Colin when Colin was reserve team coach and then moved on up to the first team and what a, what a player. And another leader, another one who, when I say he was quiet, if he did speak, again he'd sit down and hold on, sharp, he's got a point here, you know. I think it was my first hat-trick uh, for, for Everton, I think it was my first hat-trick full stop, you know, from the time playing up in Scotland as well. So people had mentioned it before, you've never scored a hat-trick before, you haven't got a match ball. Yeah, it was a full Members' Cup, if I remember it, I think Gaza might have been playing for Newcastle at the time. Uh, Neil McDonald was who came here later on in his career. He was also playing for, for Newcastle, if I remember correctly. So there wasn't a big crowd here at, uh, at Goodison, but they won the game and, and as I said, to score a hat trick, I was delighted. Okay, it wasn't a, uh, a great competition, the full members, but still to score three goals in any competition, especially at home, you know, was, a, was a, a massive bonus for myself, something I'd never done before, and I certainly enjoyed it and went on to score a few more after that. The first league fixture of December saw a welcome return to the team for Gary Stevens, now a fully-fledged England international. Stevens hadn't played since the previous season's FA Cup final, but he was back for the visit of Norwich City. You know, Gary Stevens was a he was a powerhouse, wasn't he? You know, he'd run all day. He was as strong as an ox, and um, you know, he, he was an England international player. So, all as soon as you get your best players fit, you know the. And, and certainly in Gary's case, you know, we most probably felt he, he'd missed so much, he owed us something to the squad. And when he came back, it really was another boost for the squad at a vital, vital time of the season. That's sharp. And now Heath. And now Power. It's 1 0 Everton. They're playing some terrific football at the moment, Everton. And the newly promoted side already in trouble here. Putney has made a bit of a mess of that. Gun will come. Real problems here. Sheedy. And that was handball. It's a penalty. Steve Bruce. Well, Brian Gunn absolutely fuming. Well, now Gunn has calmed down a little. It's the head to head battle here with Trevor Stephen. Usually so reliable from the spot. So Stephen against Gunn, and it's 2-0. Stephen's with the cross. It's away by Bruce. This is Poynton. Oh, and Poynton moving for the return. And Poynton has scored his first goal for Everton. Well, after six months out, Neil Poynton is back in style. Lovely one too with Sheedy. Everton still in hungry mood. Oshidi, that's absolutely brilliant, and Heath! Sublime. Absolutely sublime. Also back in the first team picture for the thrashing of Norwich was the former Canary Dave Watson. His partner in the back believes that the spell on the sidelines did him a power of good. He was able to take a back seat and maybe have a look at the way that we played, mm. which was completely different than um, the way that he played for Norwich. He was used to marking the number nine, and wherever the number nine went, he followed the number nine, and it, it happened a couple of times in the games. And uh, I, would, you know, I think it was just about trying to explain to Dave that you know we don't do that here. 
um, we mark areas, we stay on the same side of the pitch and we pass people across and onto each other. And like I said, that uh, when he got injured and then he come back, uh, he was it was as if we'd signed a different player. He, he was tremendous and you know, I think his record shows after that and it, it just shows you the, the toughness of the character as well because the crowd really turned a little bit against him. With having a crowd favourite in Derek Mountfield, the first six games I'd say weren't the best for him. The crowd were against him a little bit because he was going to take away, you know, take over from, from Derek. Um, but he won them over. And I think that shows great character in the fella, that the way he did it. Somewhat surprisingly, a mid-month trip to Luton Town was a top four clash and it ended in a 1-0 victory for the home side. The last fixture before Christmas brought Wimbledon to Merseyside for the first ever fixture at Goodison Park. There was to be no repeat of the 8-0 League Cup win of eight years previous, but it was still a relatively comfortable afternoon for Everton. Wimbledon have certainly proved they're nobody's pushovers this season. Promising break. Stephen calling for it and Stephen ghosting into space. Punishes Wimbledon. Gary Stevens to Alan Harper. Form was there, power again. <laughs> and he thought, certainly getting plenty of distance on that. And Ratcliffe will find Stephen. Stevens, Stephen, and finally it's in. Sheedy. A real sense of inevitability about it. Stephen will take over. Stevens with the cross, and it's in, Adrian Heath. 3-0. Adrian Heath just earning himself enough space. That Wimbledon win gave Peter Reid his first outing of the campaign. Reedy sadly suffered another setback that would sideline him until February. There was a late Christmas present waiting at St James's Park for the travelling Toffees who braved the cold northeasterly wind on Boxing Day. Away by Sheedy, now Heath. A promising counter here is Harper who's bombing on. Alan Harper and Paul Power is arriving and Power has scored for Everton. Oh, and power on the surge here. Pulls it back, and it's Trevor Stephen to make it two. Oh, Heath does well, and now power. Stephen again. Oh, he's got it in. Trevor Stevens, second of the game. And it's good night, Newcastle. Trevor Stephen on the burst. He's got a bad ball in either. And he. 4 0. They're at it again, Everton. That was a majestic display by Everton, but Boxing Day 1986 will be remembered by Dave Watson for far more than just a mauling of the Magpies. The Newcastle away, it was um, me missus was just having my first kid then, and we travelled up um, Christmas Day, I think we travelled up, and me missus was taken into hospital Christmas Day, and Howard said, you know, you can stay with your wife until 10 o'clock in the evening um, to see if she can have the baby by then and 10 o'clock come and she hadn't had the baby. So 
off I went up to the, the hotel in Newcastle and as soon as I got to Newcastle I had a phone call to say that she'd just given birth to a baby boy so I actually missed the birth but you know the next day the performance was magnificent from the lads and um, you know we went on to win the title so it was well worth it and I've always said to me lads you know that that medals is I mean these days you know, players would they wouldn't miss the birth for anything. But for me, football was so important at the time, and the team was doing absolutely magnificent. And I didn't want to let anyone down. And um, I don't think I let me miss us down. I think deep down, she knows. You know, it was something that I wanted to do. It's been great for the family that I've done it. Um, and things turned out okay. Forty-eight hours later, Everton went one better when they put five past Leicester City. Stephen, come well. Oh. Last ditch defending there by John O'Neill. So a corner to Everton. Kevin Sheedy inevitably to take. Can his left foot conjure something here? Andrews under a bit of pressure. It's helped back in there and in. Adrian Heath, his 13th of the season, unlucky for Leicester. And Morgan is in all kinds of trouble there. Sheedy, and now Wilkinson, who must, and Wilkinson does. 2-0 Everton. Heath, lost out, there's Morgan, <laughs> given away again, another Christmas present potentially, it's Wilkinson, oh it's trickling in, it's a defensive disaster for Leicester, I think it was actually an own goal by John O'Neill, Wilkinson looking for the credit, uh, he to Stevens, into Stephen, He's done well, Heath, 4-0, Adrian Heath's eighth goal in seven games. Trevor Stephen, the architect, Adrian Heath to finish. Another Leicester raid, fizzles out, it's point and finding Heath. Aspinall making a, a run for him wide. On oh, Sheedy. That's magnificent. Sheedy the sorcerer casts his spell. That magic wonder of a left foot has done it again. Adrian Heath's brace against Leicester gave him an impressive tally of eight goals from his last eight games. But Inchi was so much more than a striker. He was amongst the most adaptable of players who could do a great job anywhere in the park, well, almost anywhere. I don't think we allowed him to play in the back four, but he was he was certainly a valuable asset to the to the squad. Um, and still to this day, I don't really know which his best position would have been. I mean, I know, I know Graham Sharp always rates him as the best striker he's played with. Um, he, has good, he did have good movement, very, very good movement. Um, typical of maybe foreign players, the way foreign players play. Um, always coming short to go long, go long to come short. And he had that good movement and he had a great understanding with Kev Sheedy. So like most of the strikers, they had a good understanding with Kev Sheedy. He was instrumental in a, a lot of the chances that were created and a lot of the goals that were scored. He, even when Inchi wasn't playing, he was still a bubbly character. But he scored some vital goals for us. And, and you know when you've got that, that strength, even if it's coming off the bench, um, it, it's vital for the team, and you know he's he certainly done his fair share that year. Yeah, well, it, it takes a lot of character to come back from the type of injury Adrian had. You know, um, a lot of people would have finished the game because of that, but um, he showed really good determination, and you know it was well worth the wait when he did come back. December had been a very profitable month for Everton, and the last league table of 1986 made pleasant reading. Some old faces had returned to the fold, and some big wins had lifted the team onto the heels of Arsenal as the new year dawned. It was very much a case of everything to play for. It got off to a perfect start, with three goals hammered past Aston Villa, which took Everton's festive league tally to 15 from just four matches. 
Wilkinson looking to get up there. The Harper shots, and it's deflected in. Happy New Year, Alan Harper. He's to power. Oh, we'll dig out the cross. And Elliot's in trouble here. Stephen isn't. 2 0. Presented to him on a plate. Trouble again, that's Wilkinson. Heath. And cross comes in for Sheedy. <laughs> There's just never a doubt when he's in front of goal. Well, there surely isn't a player in better form anywhere in the country. The Toffees all-round game was more than a match for most teams, but it never really suited the artificial services favoured by some of the clubs in the 80s. But they were in great spirits when they went to Loftus Road on the third day of the new year, and Graham Sharp's goal gave Everton their first ever win on plastic. Sharp, looking dangerous, away from McDonald, he's away from two, and that is a quite Wonderful goal by Graham Sharp. It was a goal worthy of winning any match, let alone one on the surface that clearly gave the home side a distinct advantage. Plastic wasn't popular. It, was, it wasn't proper football. Um, I mean, the amount of, you see some of the players that played, the amount of burns they got. Um, you had to pass the feet, you couldn't pass into people's paths because it would just skid out of play. The bounce was unpredictable, you know, it would just bounce right over your head. So it was, it was total different to what you used to play in week in, week out. And um, I don't think it was a proper spectacle for supporters, you know, there was no real uh, passion in the games. It was just a case of more like five a side football. I think Sharpie scored a goal, I think he ran amazing and uh, got the winner and it was, uh, that was a big win for us but certainly um, we didn't like training on it and it was like um, it was a big, big advantage for the likes of QPR because they played on it, trained on it all the time so really we just went down on the Friday, sorted our footwear out and really wanted the game over with but certainly on the day it was a, a close encounter and uh, a great goal from Sharpie which won us the game which was again you know, another massive three points for us. Sharp was in the groove again when the FA Cup campaign began, chasing a fourth consecutive Wembley appearance in the oldest competition of the lot. Everton started with a third round tie against Southampton at Goodison Park. Right. Graham Sharp giving chase here, and Graham Sharp will score! Sheedy's cross, it's a good one, and it's sharp! A classic centre-forwards goal. Quality delivery, as ever, from Sheedy. Sharp powering in. Sharp's personal campaign suffered because of injury, but the big Scott was still more than a handful for any defence. One of the best, one of the best uh, target players. You know, if I was playing at left back and I'd look up, and Sharp, he'd be there. And it, if I had the ability to drop it into his shins or into his chest, then you knew it was going to stick. And you know, I mean, that's uh, that's a great um, uh, ability for any team to have. Any good team is built around uh, quality front men. You know, I'm sure, like when Liverpool were doing well with uh, Russian Dalglish, you know, they they uh, they had the ability to hold the ball up. Um, bring other people into play and, and the ability to score goals as well but as I referred to as well he was a great foil for Adrian Heath and they played well together they played little overs together and they had a great understanding together you know uh, Wayne Clark came into the team and played a, uh, scored a few goals uh, and Paul Wilkinson as well was there but in the main I think the main uh, partnership with Sharpie and Inchi and they, they scored a lot of goals between them. Before Everton returned to league duty, Howard Kendall became embroiled in a transfer battle with Liverpool to secure the signature of the highly coveted Leeds United midfield player Ian Snowden. 
Snowden eventually opted for Goodison ahead of Anfield, and that was viewed as something of a coup for the Blues. Yeah, it was. Snod's at the time, he'd been at Leeds and, you know, and he'd, he'd got a, a decent reputation at Leeds and I think Kenny Douglas wanted to sign him at Liverpool and uh, that was a big, big bonus for us, the fact that, you know, somebody, or Snod's chose Everton over Liverpool. Uh, he probably looked at it and thought, yeah, I like to set up at Everton, I like the look of the lads. And he was, he was a great lad, he was a great sign and he came in, uh, we used to rib him at times, he didn't score enough goals, he was a midfield player, he used to get himself in great positions, very quick. Uh, all the attributes you want, quick, could tackle, decent in the air, uh, moved back as, he, as his career you know, came to an end, he played sweeper for me at Oldham, he was a fantastic player, one of the lads, but interestingly enough when he first came to, to the club he still commuted to, to him back and forth from Doncaster, and so it wasn't doing him any good and I think his form suffered early on, but we had a a head-to-head -head one day and, and uh, said to him that you know he's probably better off moving over here the traveling wasn't doing him any good but he was a fantastic player fantastic competitor uh, just unfortunately when he was breaking into the England squad he got the injuries which you know curtailed him. Snowden made his debut as a substitute at Goodison against Sheffield Wednesday but it was Trevor Stephen and Dave Watson who earned themselves the headlines. Feedy's cross looking dangerous well there was a hand up there and it will be a penalty. Looked like Lee Chapman. So Trevor Stephen. And he'll make it 1 0. Beats Martin Hodge. And goes the free kick. Oh, Watson's there. And Watson will finish it off. Well, he'll enjoy this moment, Dave Watson. That made it three consecutive clean sheets for the Blues. A tribute not just to the defence, but to the man who led them, Kevin Ratcliffe. Brilliant captain, um, a real character. Another one who tested you all the time as a coach and as a member of staff and he wanted to know what was going on and he, he'd want to know why we were trying this particular thing and he really was a well-respected captain, Kevin Ratcliffe, an excellent player. I mean, he was a fantastic player, but the, uh, the rest of them looked up to him, you know. We certainly knew who the captain was. Trevor Stevens' goal against Sheffield Wednesday took him to 11 in the league for the season and he was once again living up to the high standards he'd established for himself since joining the club from Burnley. You know, everybody could see what a fantastic footballer he was. Uh, not just a, uh, a wide man who, who created goals for setting a forward, but he was always very uh, prolific himself. He'd go on the back post, he was, he was good in the air, uh, two, two great feet. Uh, so he was, a, he was an integral part of not just the, the first championship winning side, but the second one as well. And you know, that was a shame later on that we lost him as well. But in that campaign, certainly, he was an influential player. Everton versus Liverpool Cup ties were commonplace during the mid-80s, but when the old rivals clashed at Goodison in the fifth round of the League Cup, the spoils went to the visitors. Nottingham Forest inflicted a first defeat of the calendar year on Everton at the end of January, winning 1-0 at the City Ground. But the love affair with the FA Cup continued unabated when Ian Snowden's first goal for the club was enough to secure a safe passage into round five, the expense of Bradford City. Snowden was never going to be a regular contributor on the goals front, but there was little doubt that the Blues had recruited a player of genuine quality. He was an attacking midfield player who made unbelievably long runs to get in the box and uh, when the ball was out wide he'd make long runs and he, he had a knack of scoring, scoring goals, Snod, and um, a really good footballer and a, a great character as well. He was a smashing character, Snod, and he fitted in with them perfect because the place was full of them and sometimes it was they were they were such strong characters that you had to be careful about opening your mouth at times you know because you get slaughtered just for saying something uh, something normal you know but he fitted in well with them with more than half the season gone the title race was really hotting up with arsenal and liverpool joining everton in what was increasingly becoming a three horse race nottingham forest and luton town were still technically in the mix but both lacked the strength in depth of the leading trio. The road back to match fitness for Peter Reid had been a long and frustrating one. 
a kingpin of the Everton engine room that had won the title two years earlier, his influence had been missed. He'd already aborted one comeback, but he was now ready to stake a claim once more. But what was he like when he was on the sidelines? Uh, pain in the backside. He probably was to, to the physios, um, you know, because obviously he liked to train, he liked to play. And uh, I know myself, I had my fair share of injuries and it's very, very frustrating. And, you know, sometimes when you're very close to fitness, you know, you, you want to get back sooner than probably you should do. But, uh, you know, he's that type of competitor and really wants to be out there playing and, and helping the lads. So, as I say, you know, him coming back at Christmas was a, was a turning point for us as well. Pat van den Howe also made a return to action for what turned out to be a routine success over Coventry City. Ratcliffe. Harry Stevens. Making good progress here. Deflected in. Gary Stevens has levelled it up for Everton. Here's Reed. Now Stephen again. Reed. And they're queuing up in there. Oh, was that handball? It was. Dave Bennett. Well, Trevor Peake leading the Coventry protests. They feel that it couldn't have been intentional. So Trevor Stephen. And Everton take the lead. Emphatically dispatched. Coventry agree, but they are behind. Watson. Stephen, can he get the shot away? He can. It's Watson. Be retrieved by Harper. Heath. That'll do. Adrian Heath with a goal that will surely put Everton top tonight. The question now, can they stay there? I mean, I used to always dread picking up the paper to see Reedy was injured. I mean, that, that might have been just me as a fan. But I always thought Reedy and the team, just by his presence, mm -hmm. gave them that little bit extra. You know, he wasn't as frightened as Pat Van Den Howe. <laughs> but, you know, he did give them that little bit extra Reedy, you know. And I think that was one of his best seasons. That win over the Sky Blues lifted Everton to the top of the table for the first time this season. The Blues were the form team in the division, but amidst the free-flowing football that was simply too good for most teams, Everton could also grind out results through sheer endeavour and hard work. One such game was Oxford United, and Paul Wilkinson's goal earned a point in a 1-1 draw. Wilkinson scored again in the next match, but the FA Cup fifth round trip to Plough Lane was to end in defeat. Heath. With battling qualities. Here's Stephen. Oh, that's a lovely ball. Oh, Besson, bit of a rush of blood. They're queuing up in the middle. And Wilkinson will score. Perfect start for Everton. Some nifty footwork by Leicester Shackler, the referee. Besson's rush of blood. Heath's cross. Wilkinson rising above Sanchez, 1-0. So Everton's love affair with the FA Cup was over. Having reached the previous three finals, it was somewhat ironic that a bid for Wembley history should perish in the unglamorous surroundings of Plough Lane. What a place. They, they made it uh, oh, very difficult for you in all aspects, not just on the field uh, where they were tough competitors, you know, played the long ball, you had to be up for a fight, you had to defend for your life. Uh, but off the field as well, when you went to Plough Lane, the dressing rooms, they made sure that the, the windows had been open all day, uh, the place was freezing, there was no electric light bulbs, they took all the light bulbs out, uh, all the electricity was off, the baths were cold, the showers were cold. So they made it very difficult for you. You, you come in at half time for your, your tea, uh, nobody dare uh, try the tea because you didn't know what was in the tea. So it was a very intimidating place. With just the league to concentrate on now, Everton drew 0-0 at Old Trafford. The Blues were timing their finishing run superbly well and entered the vital month of March, sitting proudly at the First Division Summit. There was still just a single point separating the leading three, little margin for error. The season was developing into an exciting race for the crown, and Paul Powers not only enjoying himself, he was learning too.
as a back four player, I'd never really been taught, and I'd worked with good coaches uh, like Malcolm Allison and when I was at Manchester City, but I'd never really been taught how to defend as a back four, uh, as a unit, you know, and uh, hold the line and when to drop and when to uh, and when to press the ball, um, until I'd worked with Colin and, uh, and and Howard, you know, and made the made the game so much easier because the whole team was compact. Uh, everybody knew what everybody else was doing. If the if Ratters and Dave Watson were letting a player run, they knew that the the fullbacks would be would be tucked in, and you know it was uh, uh, it was a uh, an interesting phase and a knowledgeable phase for me. You know, and I was 32, 33 when I played for Everton. So the defeat to Charlton Athletic in the Four Members Cup wasn't mourned by the faithful. It wasn't a competition revered by the supporters. Although this particular fixture will always be remembered as the night that Neville Southall scored a goal from the spot during the penalty shootout that decided the outcome. Hopping for the short one this time. Oh, and it's Wilkinson! Paul Wilkinson for Everton. Wilkinson will seize on this. Steven to Heath. Heath surely. Boulder denies him. And finally it's in by Trevor Stephen. Another spot scorer was Neil Adams, who put his Nightmare Charity Shield start behind him to become a key member of the squad. Neil was at Stoke, of course, and I think maybe Adrian Heath and Paul Bracewell, who'd been at Stoke, might have uh, uh, you know, might have put a word in for Neil. But but he was a good, uh, he was a good solid player. He's had a good career, you know. Uh, he finished off at Oldham and Norwich and done really well. Um, and he did well in spells for uh, for Everton. Always looked like a wide player who could score a goal, and certainly able to go past uh, the fullback and and provide opportunities for others, you know. And uh, he played a he played a not a major part of that that year, but a, a significant role, that, you know. So uh, he did well for us. A teenage John Ebrill had been given his first taste of senior action in that match at Charlton. And there was another new face in the Royal Blue when Everton went to Watford. An injury to Graham Sharp had given Howard Kendall a striking problem. And he solved it by signing Wayne Clark from Birmingham City. Like most of Kendall's recruits, it proved to be a shrewd one, even though his Blues career started in defeat at Vicarage Road. Oh, and that'll be seized upon there. And maybe the break is on for Everton. Here's Van den Hout. Now, it's Paul Power, you see there, making the overlap. Possibilities here. And Heath and Everton have scored. A lightning counter-attack. Van den Hout with the initial surge. Power with the overlap. And Heath on the spot to beat Coton. Watford were nobody's pushovers at the time, but the Vicarage Road setback left Everton facing a test of character. Terry Darracott was confident that they were fully equipped to pass that test with flying colours. The team was full of them, and they were real leaders, leaders of men, you know. And they all looked at one another, and they all had their own say, you know. And, they, they, and, and when Reedy was speaking, everybody would sit down and listen. When Ratters was speaking, They'd all sit down and listen, and there was a number of them in the team, you know, that uh, that spoke up. And when they did, there was not oh, what's he talking about, sort of thing. No, they sat down and listened, and it was that sort of um, atmosphere amongst them, you know. They had a lot of leaders in the team, and you thought, like, if they have a problem, sometimes if they have a problem on the pitch, there's not much you can do about it from the side, because once the game's on, that's it. They've got to get on with it. But there was players on the pitch who could solve problems out, you know, which, which was fantastic. To reclaim the first division crown, Kendall knew that his team had to put together a good run of form at just the right time. Liverpool had taken over at the top of the table, and although Everton had games in hand, the middle of March was the perfect time to kick off a great winning streak. First to be put to the sword was Southampton at Goodison Park. Stephen getting involved. Stephen again, find the cross, he can, well it's an own goal by Mark Wright. Mm. 
Ratcliffe. Watson elects to go long. And that's away by right. And it's going to be power. Well, Shilton, furious, but he's beaten on his near post. And Everton with a firm grip on the game. Stephen. Stevens to toss it in. That's a great header. Dave Watson, nine minutes into the second half, puts it beyond any doubt at all. Great delivery from Stevens, and they've finished the match. Another goal there for Paul Power, who is already just about the first division's bargain purchase of the season. I would uh, had a chat with me um, and said, what do you think with regards to Paul Power? And we had a pint together and talked over the pint, you know, and I said, well, look, I said, what I know of him, I said, I don't know him personally, I know him as a player. I said, but he's obviously a tremendous professional. And um, I said, I would always give time for people who are, who are great professionals. He, he, he never misses games. He's 30 plus now. He's still in the first team. He's still as fit as a fiddle. And I said, he, he, he's been the, the, the captain of Man City and he looks as though he's got great respect. I said, I would, I would always recommend somebody like that. And to be fair, he comes to Everton, did a fantastic job, both at left back and left side midfield. If she was injured, you know. No, not quite come to the boilers yet. Stephen guiding it on. Can a breakthrough be found before half time? Now, his power, Boulder with the save, and Heath coming in. That's surely a penalty. Paul Miller and Adrian Heath in some pain here. He was bound to just turn it in, but for the intervention of Paul Miller, who is rightly cautioned. So Trevor Stephen against Bob Boulder to bring Everton the breakthrough. He scores. And they've not quite been at it as yet, Everton, but they do have the lead. Ratcliffe. Oh, Stephen with a little flick header there. Oh, that's a chance and a goal. <laughs> Gary Stevens. Well, it was a tackle as much as anything. Dwayne Clark foraging. Stevens just slid in, beat Mark Reed to it, and it's 2 1. And get behind Liverpool close to six points. When Everton went to Hybrid at the end of the month, they were six points adrift of Liverpool, but had played two games less. It was therefore a must-win match against an Arsenal side that by now had fallen away to leave the Mersey rivals battling for glory. Rowcastle. Oh, that's cut out. Well, Lukic has decided to come and deal with this. Could be problems here, it's Clark. That is a fantastic finish by Wayne Clark. What a wonderful way to open his account for Everton. And what a crucial goal it could be in the championship race. The quick thinking of a natural goal scorer. John Lukic with the error. Wayne Clark returned it with interest. A terrific way for Wayne Clark to open his account. The wily striker had really hit the ground running was showing that he had the ability and the work ethic to make an impact. Now, Wayne Clark had always scored goals wherever he'd been and uh, Howard was a gambler with players. And um, he, he looked long and deep at certain situations and thought, like, I'll take a chance on him. And it wasn't, wasn't always massive money. You know, Howard would take a chance with somebody who didn't cost so much. And Clark, he'd come in. And to be fair, he did all right at Everton. I thought he did a good job at Everton. He wasn't a regular, but we had the likes of um, Sharpie and Adrian Heath. And obviously, you, you can't just be doing with two strikers. Uh, the modern game now proves that you certainly need four at least. 
No, because you need to change them round because it's a hard job up there, you know, with and without the ball. And the way Everton played, the front two had to work really hard off the ball. Some teams don't work that way. They say, well, if the opposition's got the ball, come back and have a breather. Not the Everton front two. The Everton front two had to work their back four. They keep it through and out of the back four. Our front two were bang at it. You know, so they, sometimes you needed to give them a breather, although they didn't like it. <laughs> they never liked it, even though it was, you know, it was uh, the right thing to do. They used to get a bit of a cob on, you know, when you took them off, but that's, that's the way they are. The only thing he lacked was the slyness of his brother. Yeah. Because um, Alan was a, was a very sly player. But he scored some, some vital goals for us, Wayne Clark. While Everton were winning at Arsenal, Liverpool had surprisingly lost at home to Wimbledon. And so the pendulum had once again swung towards the Blues. The Toffees still had nine games to go, but their destiny was now very much in their own hands. One of the unsung heroes of the season was Alan Harper, a utility man of genuine quality. Harper was the model of consistency whenever he was. It was his goal at Stamford Bridge that kept the winning run going. Everton bringing a 2-1 win back from the Kings Road. I always remember Harpo uh, when I first came down and played against him in the Liverpool Everton mini derbies, if you like, and never used to get a kick. He used to play, could I play right back or centre back at the time? And I thought then what a fantastic player, could read the game well. Uh, he was unfortunate in the, in the first championship win inside that, you know, him and Kevin Richardson were bit part players, but everybody knew when they, when they were called upon, they would, you know, week in, week out, they'd put in, you know, fantastic performances for us. Harpo came in again, and as I said, he could play right back, left back, centre back, midfield, you know, whatever you wanted him to do, he would do a good job. Same as Kevin Richardson, uh, round about the, the first time round as well. But Harpo, uh, he'd experienced, I think he came from Liverpool, where he wasn't really going to get a, a start, but he came in here, uh, showed what a good footballer he was, and every time, as I said, he was dependable, Mr Dependable. Wherever you played him, you knew we were going to get a good shift out from him. This was now championship form, without question. When West Ham United were put to the sword in spectacular fashion at Goodison Park, even Peter Reid joined in the goal-scoring fun. Tricky feet. And Watson gets the flick on. It's Clark, and Everton take the lead. Well, they've unearthed a man who can find the net with regularity just at the vital time. No battling. Oh, it's Reed with the shot. Oh, that's a stunner from Peter Reed. His first goal since February last year. And it's one to remember. Stephen was up initially. We get a second bite of the cherry here. And it's bouncing all over the place. Stephen maintains his composure. Stevens! Oh. Well, they're absolutely running riot here, Everton. Stephen maintained his composure, and Stevens with a rocket. And Stephen Flick, and Watson makes it four. Well, the way they play, you have to believe that the title is returning to Goodison Park. Dave Watson gets in on the act. West Ham were no mugs that season, but they were simply brushed aside by a rampant Everton. There was such an air of belief throughout the entire squad. Well, you know, when I do these after dinner things and, you know, question and answers, that's what people ask me, you know, what was the, you know, what was it like in the dressing rooms? And they say, you know, when you're getting changed and you look at level south, all the back four, the midfield players, and you're thinking, well, if we go out and play maybe 60, 70%, you know, no disrespect to the opposition, um, but any, you know, on the day, if we all sort of play to that, then we should win. If we do play 80, 90%, then we definitely will win. So it was, uh, it, it was self-confidence where, you know, you looked in the dressing room, there was a lot of good characters, you know, a lot of leaders, even though Kevin Ratliff was the, the captain. We had a lot of leaders on the team and um, we certainly took those into the performances. 
The next team in the firing line was Aston Villa. A tough away game, but by now an all too predictable outcome. See if you can spot Goodison legend Andy Gray in his Aston Villa colours. Sheedy on the bully. That's a stunner. A potentially priceless goal and a goal of sublime quality. And we've come to expect that. Yet another goal for the ever expanding Kevin Sheedy collection. That was 15 for him now in all competitions. When it came to making contact with the football, Sheeds had very few equals in the game. God knows what he would be able to do with the ball in these days. Because the ball was, I wouldn't say it was, it was a lot harder, but it was certainly harder than what it is now. Uh, not as much movement. Uh, and he used to make things happen with them mitre balls that were like medicine balls. Um, and he could bend them, he could find, you know, a pass 40, 50 yards away, 60 yards away. Um, Sometimes with the outside of his foot, he, he was just so relaxed in the way that he played, never rushed. Um, he'd never really go past people, but he passed past people. And it didn't matter who, which foot you kept him on, if you kept him on his right foot, he'd bend it with the outside of his left and showed him down the line, he'd whip across him. He, he was so instrumental in, in the team. Wayne Clark was proving to be more than an able deputy for Graham Sharp. The brother of the former Leeds United goal-scoring legend Alan displayed all the family traits when he plundered a wonderful hat-trick against Newcastle United. Stevens to Stephen. A little deep cross there. He'll drop for Poynton. And he'll drop for power as well. He'll find the cross, Wayne Clark will find the route to go. <laughs> right. A good ball now for Heath, will turn. And Clark surely must. He'll make it too. And they're very close now, Everton. They're within touching distance of their ninth title. Odin's cross. Stevens went down. Surely he was fouled there. Powell will get it back in anyway. And Clark will score a hat-trick. It's the first of his career. And what an impact this man has made. Well, surely they believe now. Wayne Clark quite rightly took the headlines after that one, but just as importantly for the coaching staff, it was another clean sheet built on the rock that was Kevin Ratcliffe and Dave Watson. Their first season together was developing brilliantly. I'm sure Rat has helped them. I mean, the partnership was good because Watto was a right-sided centre-back and Kevin was a left-sided centre-back and they formed a terrific partnership. Um, people might say that Kevin wasn't as dominant in the air as he might have been as a centre-back, but Dave Watson certainly was. But Kevin Ratcliffe was like lightning, you know, and anything that went over either of them. I always used to look at Ratters and think, he's that quick. You know, if something went in behind him and people say, get back as quick as you can, knock it back to the keeper. He used to get there that quick, he could turn around and play forward. You know, and he was really, oh, he's, he was brilliant. He'd have been great for Dave Watson, he'd have helped him no end. And to be fair, they were a great partnership. The win over Newcastle was Everton's seventh in succession and that by any standards was championship form. You know, Howard always regards, I think, that, that year's title triumph as his greatest achievement at this club because of the number of players he had to use and the changes he had to make. And I think during that seven-game spell, the sort of southern-based press and a lot of the southern-based supporters, I think that's what confirmed Everton of that era as a great footballing team. The, the, the football they produced in that seven-game winning spell was just, just as good as anything that's been produced in this country since the war by any club. 
When the return derby at Anfield loomed, Everton were six points clear at the top and they had the comfort of a game in hand. They were now clear title favourites and not even a defeat against Liverpool could seriously dent their charge. Kevin Cheney scored the consolation goal in front of the cop and didn't he let them know. A free kick given against Hansen. Climbing all over Wayne Clark. The Hooper will want the wall to be right here because it certainly will favour the left foot of Kevin Sheedy. Peter Reid there having his say. And I think Hooper has some idea of what's coming. It will be Sheedy. Oh, that's absolutely magnificent. A Sheedy special. Well, Hooper knew what was coming. He could do precious little about it. Well, you don't need me to explain this. Stunning. People ask me what's you know your favourite free kick, and I have to say there was one against Ipswich, but certainly uh, that one for for power, and it was unsavable as soon as it left my foot, and as soon as I hit it, I knew it was in. Um, so I managed to, to run to the cop end and, and give a, a gesture to the cop and uh, uh, got called before the FA over it and managed to talk my way out of it. So it was a, a double whammy really for me. It was nice to, to obviously score on the cop end but also make a gesture and get away with it. It was now just a matter of time before Everton were confirmed as the champions once again. That terrific run of seven consecutive victories had come just at the right time with Kendall able to select his teams with a greater degree of consistency the crowning ceremony was already at the planning stage when May commenced. A goalless draw at home to relegation-bound Manchester City wasn't the best result, but at least it was another clean sheet for the irrepressible Neville Southall. The Blues keeper had impressed everyone with his determination since fighting his way back from injury. If you look at his building, he was stocky and, and maybe even appeared a little bit overweight uh, at times. But he worked solidly with uh, Jim Barron that season. Jim Barron was, uh, was the goalkeeper coach. And uh, he used to work uh, with, the, with the rest of the squad. And then he'd go and do extra. Uh, and he always wanted to do his individual work. You know, he, he wasn't happy to be joining in with the, with the possessions, like, which most, most people, uh, goalkeepers used to enjoy. But Nev would do that. And he was good at it as well. He was a good outfield player, you know. He was not bad at the running. He'd be, up, you know, he's one of the few goalkeepers who'd be up there in the running line, you know. And uh, so, yeah, a good uh, and a great bloke, you know. If you if you ever needed a, a visit to a hospital, like Nev would be first in line to do that. So the stage was set for a title party. Everton went to Norwich City on Bank Holiday Monday, knowing that a win would secure the title. And if Carrow Road was an unlikely venue for an Everton jamboree, there was an even more unlikely goalscorer waiting to take centre stage. Pull back for Vanden Howe. The priceless breakthrough comes. Oh. Might reach Rosario. Oh. Oh, an opportunity. Nervous moments here. And Southall and Power in a bit of confusion here. And David Phillips can't pick up the scraps. Everton's day, their ninth title. I'm absolutely delighted, really. I mean, it's been tremendously satisfying to, to win the championship again after narrowly missing out last season. And even better for taking it from Liverpool. If you don't mind who you take championships off, um, to say that, I mean, our fans were desperately disappointed. We missed out on the league championship and the FA Cup last season to Liverpool. And uh, we've, we've reversed it this season. The players did eventually make their way back to the dressing room and back onto the team bus. It was on the long road back to Merseyside that one of the most famous parties in the club's history took place. And I always remember coming onto the bus uh, afterwards and, and Terry Dalicott, who was our assistant at the time, said to the driver, make sure you don't go over 50 mile an hour. And Norwich in those days was a heck of a journey, like five hours, whatever. Uh, I think the journey 
We ended up for about eight hours or something. We took our time, came back, maybe stopped off a few times at uh, local hostelries and enjoyed the atmosphere there. But a fantastic trip back because when you look at the two championship winning sides, I think ev ev everybody could name the first championship winning sides, the team that won the Cup Winners' Cup final. Uh, but when you, you talk about the second championship, it was more of a squad effort. We had a lot of injuries. Uh, Howard bought players in who'd done fantastically well for us. Uh, so it was more of a squad effort in the second the second time around, but uh, it certainly was a momentous trip home from Norwich. It wasn't far enough, to be honest with you. And the, the coach went too fast for most of us. He kept telling the driver to slow down and, uh, you know, and <laughs> take the sights in and that, you know. We didn't want to get back too early because it was such a lovely journey back, you know, and uh, there's a lot of entertainment going on. Uh, a few bevies. And to be fair, everyone was there. I, I went down. I thought I was going down because he was taking extra kit with them, because I was the reserve team coach again. But I was going down as a as part of the staff, and uh, hopefully to enjoy what would be a great occasion. And it certainly turned out that way. But on the coach going back, uh, everybody was there. All the all the coaching staff, the medical staff, the chairman uh, Sir Philip Carter, the secretary Jim Greenwood, and it was just brilliant. It was brilliant that they were all there to enjoy this journey back you know and if you can't enjoy yourself after winning the championship then it's a sad state of affairs you know i know we're all different we're all different um some enjoy it in a different way but um it was a sing song and a few jokes and a few t stories and that you know it was about five and a half hours and uh, i don't think i made birmingham <laughs> um a little bit of a, a sing song on the way home with uh teddy daracott being the dj and inviting people up and it, it was great because he sort of got on the mic and introduced everybody and asking people to come up but he was he, he was calling it champion radio and it, it was it was so funny and i think them things live with you more than things that happened in the match you remember them type of things traveling home on the bus than you do actually um you know playing the game best coach journey i've ever had i tell you what Teddy Darracott was an absolute star on that coach all the way home. He made everybody get up and do a turn on the on the mic, like so. Even people like Pat Van Den Hout, who you know, was would not entertain that sort of uh, promoting himself in front of everybody else. He'd he'd entertain himself in other ways, like but probably more quietly, you know. But he had to get up and sing, and everybody. Uh, it was a fantastic journey home, like you know, and uh, all down to Teddy. Uh, but yeah, it was. It was good to win it away from home. I think it would have been even better if we'd have won it at Goodison, though, because uh, you know it's it's nice to uh, to do it in front of your your home crowd. And but there was a good following down there as well, like, you know. And, uh, it, it only needed the one nil, and that was it. Yeah, I mean it's, it's amazing how it works out. Um, going back there and um, Pat fans are now getting the vital goal. I mean it would have been nice to have had a home game where we clinched it, but you know it was as far as ways we could possibly be. And um, I always remember the trip home was absolutely magnificent. You know, he was singing and Terry Zaracott on the microphone. Um, great memories of the trip home. But it was um, it was absolutely a big relief, you know, because it's a long, long season. And it's, it's the marathon, isn't it? You know, people win the cup and that, and it's a one-off. But um, over a season, the, the relief amongst the lads that we'd actually clinched the title, you know, it took some getting over. And we had um, enough time to get over it on the five hours home on the trip. I remember the clips from it and how it fallen off his seat in the dugout, which is always good memories. But certainly now it's uh, the journey back from Norwich was, was great. I mean, it's like everything that you want and, you know, you've won the, the championship again. Uh, to win the first time was great. It's a new experience. But to actually, the way it happened with the amount of players that we used, um, it was really a, a squad victory over this, uh, you know, for, for winning the championship. Uh, so it was uh, great memories, that, that journey back and obviously long into the night. I sat at the front with Colin. And of course, the mic was plugged into the dashboard, and uh, we'd not got underway very long. And I'd got hold of the mic and, and decided to be the MC for the evening, you know. And uh, I said, We'll be calling up some uh, guest singers and whatever, you know. And I gave a song, and it was acting the goat, and um, just trying to, you know, keep everybody going because it's a long journey home. And then we invited. Uh, guest singers up, you know, and we had plenty of them on that trip. It was absolutely, it, they were brilliant, you know. I can remember two or three of them. There was a few of them wouldn't do it. I mean, never would never get up and sing. 
Pat Van and I would never get up and sing. They wouldn't entertain that. Them two, get lost. I'm not doing that, you know. But there was plenty of them that wanted to, you know. And the, and the, the ones I remember uh, the most, the Dave Watson used to sing Two Little Boys, the Rolf Harris song, you know. And he was brilliant. He really, he played the part, you know. Um, Ian Snodden sang, um, I don't know the title, Trailers for Sailor Rent. And he knew every word to that. And he really put his heart and soul into that. Paul Power sang the, the Music Man, and he was great at that. And he, he he could play the part while he was singing that, you know, and the lads liked it. He got a bit of stick for that, but I mean, the lads liked it. And a few of the others got up, but I can't remember the songs as well as them three, you know. And um, Adrian Heath would do Frank Sinatra, I think. Adrian Heath thought he was Frank Sinatra, you know. And he, he, he would sing, he'd probably sing My Way or something like that, you know. But the, oh, the, the atmosphere was brilliant. And we had to drop one or two of them off coming back because, you know, they leave cars at different places and that, you know, at the time. And uh, But by the time we got back to Belfield, you knew you'd been on a, you knew you'd been on a trip, you know. But just the thought of getting back and, and recalling what had gone on, you know, and the fact that Everton were champions was unbelievable. It really was. The night couldn't have um, gone on long enough for, for most of us, you know. What a day and what a way to celebrate. But before the trophy presentation party could begin at Goodison Park, five days later, Everton had Luton Town to contend with. And two goals from Trevor Stephen were enough to earn him the mantle of leading marksman for the season. Luton just crashing the title party at the moment. Reed involved. Oh, and against the crossbar, and was that well, all kinds of things going on there? But handball spotted by the referee, and a penalty to Everton. Well, Reed's effort, Cannon's back off the bar. All kinds going on in there. The feet were flying, and I assume it must have struck the arm of Rob Johnson. So Trevor Stephen against Les Seeley to put the champions of England on level terms. Which he does. Well, they want the party to go with a bang. Trevor Stephen has certainly resumed normal service. Oh, Stephen. Oh, and as he brought down, there he is. Stacey North with a challenge. And Everton will have another chance from the penalty spot. This time... ..to give Everton the lead. Stephen scores. They're in party mood now, all right. And Stephen's coming in, and it's in. Graham Sharp. it up in style another win but once again the match between Everton and Luton Town had an edge to it there was never any love lost between the Toffees and the Hatters in the 1980s very tasty and funny enough I was speaking to Steve Foster who, who came up against many times at Luton we were in uh, Le Mans in the summer and we were just talking about in that last game and we said what was the script because I remember going into uh, to the late Les Seeley, you know, for a challenge, and I caught him in the head, and he was unconscious for a bit, and that sort of just kicked it off a little bit. But uh, speaking to Steve Foster afterwards, and uh, they had something against them, and I don't know whether doing the semi-finals, we always used to beat them or whatever. Uh, but they had Mick Harford in there, they had Mal Donaghy, so they had a few scrappers, 
so even when we were getting presented with the, the trophy uh, that day, Mick Harford was waiting at the side of the pitch. He wanted to start it all off again, kick it off in the, in the tunnel. Big Steve Foster was telling us this, and it was incredible. We, they just did not like us. We didn't like them. Uh, but we just had this little bit of rivalry between us. But even then, in the last game, they had nothing to play for. We thought we'll just go out here, it's going to be a jolly, they'll come and you know, uh, respect us, but that wasn't the case. I think the, the Sealy incident maybe sparked it off a little bit, we had a bit of a goal going down the tunnel at half time, so it certainly was lively, considering it was an end of season, like you know, getting the trophy presented. And as I said, they, they had a dislike to us, but we had one for them as well. I think that's what made us such a good side, is because we were a team that could mix our game. If people wanted to have a battle against us, we'd have a battle against them. Um, they'd let us play football, we'd play football. And I think that's what's so good about the, the side right the way through, um, that we could mix, mix and match. Derek Mountfield had lost his place in the team when Dave Watson joined the club, but he was still popular with the fans, and it was great for him to score the final goal of the season. A fitting way for a memorable campaign to end, the Toffees were the champions for a ninth time, Whilst the main man, Howard Kendall, was an automatic and popular choice as Manager of the Year, it was time to reflect on all of those who had made such a huge contribution. Paul Power's the ultimate professional footballer, fantastic man, all those years of service at Man City, never won anything at all. Uh, you know, Man City through and through, and Howard, you know, just said, you know, you, you know, could come over, you might only have one season, you'll be a squad member, you can fill in at various places when we get in. And of course he played, I think, virtually every league game, missed two, I think, towards the end. But he was absolutely fantastic. And again, you know, come the end of the season, I remember distinctly going downstairs and talking to him, because he, he is one of the sort of intelligentsia of your modern footballers, is Paul Powell, lovely bloke, very intelligent. And he said, I can't believe this. He said, I spent all those years at Man City, won absolutely nothing. I come here for one glorious season, and he said, I've won the league championship medal. But he was fantastic that season, absolutely fantastic. All winning sides are easy teams to, to captain. You ask any captain of uh, every great side, um, you know, you, you'll say that you're lucky that you had instrumental people in that team that were, like I say, figureheads and, and strong characters. But all good sides have got them. Um, we were lucky that we had the likes of Andy Gray um, when he was here, um, you know, Peter Reid, nevertheless. Neville, myself, Dave Watson, Graham Sharp, all strong characters, spine of the side, um, right the way down the middle, and they, they were strong characters. Um, that's not to say Kev Sheedy wasn't a strong character or, or Trevor Stevens. They, they would have the say, but they were a little bit more quieter uh, on the pitch. But when, when you've got players like that around you, it does make things a little bit easier as a captain. Kevin Ratcliffe was, was fantastic, and I remember when I started covering uh, Everton, 80-81, just around the time Howard arrived, you know, he was looking, he always said that you need a, you need a strong defence. If you're going to win anything, you have to have A, a strong defence, and B, a natural-born leader in the middle of that defence. And Ratcliffe just epitomised that. He was fantastic. I mean, bearing in mind that you had Ratcliffe and then you had Neville Southall behind him. I mean, it was, it's not impregnable, but it's as good as it's going to get. I mean, Ratcliffe was a fantastic player and completely underrated. I mean, you know, it always amazes me, apart from Evertonians, when they're drawing up lists of the best centre-backs of the last 20, 30 years, he never ever gets a mention. And I find that really strange. I think Terry was a reserve team coach, if I can remember rightly. Um, but I think on every trip, because we never played on Saturdays of reserves then, that he travelled with the first team. And he was a character. Terry was no doubt a character. Um, and a good disciplinarian as well with the lads you know they knew that they couldn't uh, sort of overstep the line with him uh, and I think that's what we give him we give him the utter respect um, and we had a great time Terry was completely different to somebody like Colin who Colin was more of the serious type and you know wanting to get the, the training right and you be right the, Terry was he, Terry would want to do that but he had this lighter side to him where he, he, he relaxed more and was still maybe one of the boys, if you know what I mean, and uh, yeah, he was, like I say, great, great person to have around, great coach to have around. And that was, like I say, with Howard uh, bringing these people in, the likes of Colin, because I mean, obviously he promoted him from reserve team coach to, to first team coach. And um, with Terry being there as well, Terry was, was excellent. Well, I couldn't speak highly, highly enough of Colin Harvey. Um, I mean, I've known him since I was a young boy, from the day I first walked into Everton in 1966. Um, and he, I always found him a really 
as well as being a great player, a really uh, warm man, you know, I mean, approachable. Even as a 15-year-old, me walking in through the door, and I spoke to him and said that I knew his uncle. His uncle ran the pub where my dad used to drink. I said, I know your uncle. And from then on, that was it. We had a good friendship, you know, and we're still great friends today. But his, his contribution was unbelievable for me. And I used to, I learnt a lot off Colin Harvey and used to watch him working and his dedication and attention to detail was unbelievable. And it would have been till the day he packed in. Um, he was forever looking at reports and studying videos about the opposition and he never left no stone unturned, you know, to try and help, help us get the result the following week, you know. And he was a great example to us all. He really was and he must have, you know, for Howard to have him as his assistant and first team coach. And I know the, what the players thought of him anyway. Um, but aside from, aside from all that, he was, he was a tremendous guy. It, it, the thing about Colin, and he's still the same today, isn't he? It's difficult to get anything out of him. You know, whenever you do a function with him, it's don't get me up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he was almost a quiet man, but apparently when he is in there in charge of the team, because I spoke to some of the people who were in the team under him, you know, and they said he was a totally different man uh, when he got, got on the training ground or in the dressing room. He was, he was authority. There's no frills about uh, Colin or Howard. Um, you know, what you see is what you get. Um, Howard's magnificent man management, you know, was it was unbelievable. And as a, you know, as, as time and of signing big players at big, at, you know, vital times, i.e. your Paul Powers and that, uh, your Neil Poynton's, you know, it, Wayne Clark's, it was all vital to the squad that season. Um, Colin, on the other hand, Colin's, uh, Colin doesn't change if you've just won the cup. It doesn't matter, Colin will have a smile, but then he'll be looking to the next training session, Colin. He was um, such a good professional. And, uh, you know, when you see him these days as well, he's, he's still in good nick, Colin. Howard, you know, used to let his hair down when he had some. And um, Colin would keep his feet on the ground a little bit more. Um, but, yeah, great team, great partnership. There was good spirit, you know, and that, that was what was great about Howard as well. He was, he was great with the players, you know. He knew uh, when, when to be disciplined with them. Uh, but he also could be friendly with them, you know, and he knew how to how to work with the directors, how to work with the press, and probably as good a manager as as, as I've worked with. Colin was the, the coach on the on the pitch. Howard was more uh, like to join in, like to like to play and train, and you could see he was a, a great player from his you know when he trained. Um, so I think they gelled really well. Um, Colin was more uh, stern and sort of really. You know, got into the players, whereas Howard was more your man manager. That's, I mean, that's, people ask me what is his best um, asset, and I said, certainly say his man management skills. Uh, not so much the players that are playing and, and he's picking week in, week out. That's the easy part, but the ones that, you know, maybe felt they should have been in the team, um, he sort of cajoled them, talked to them, you know, explained the situation, and, and when they got that opportunity, they went and played for him and for the team. So, you know, certainly they, they worked as a, you know, a good team. I mean, to be fair, I've played with some good players at Manchester City over the years, the likes of Trevor Francis and Dennis Stewart and others, certainly Colin Bell. And, um, but, you know, they'd always been in different teams and, uh, and I think Everton had, uh, had a tremendous group of players, but also a great um, work ethic and a great togetherness, you know. The players still belong to the public. And we're, I think we were just going into the 90s when the players and the public, the supporters became divided, divided, until now this huge chasm between players and supporters. It wasn't like that then. The most wins, the fewest defeats. The most goals scored, the fewest goals conceded. The final league table made for proud reading for Evertonians. And nobody could deny their right to be back at the very summit of English football. Howard Kendall once again won the Manager of the Year. And only an astonishing goals campaign from Tottenham's Clive Allen surely prevented Kevin Ratcliffe from winning the Players' Award. If 1985 had been a team effort, then 1987 was very much a squad achievement. Kendall had wheeled and dealed, swapped and changed, and yet again had produced a winning formula. Five different players ended the season with double figures, and that was a testament to the strength in depth at Goodison Park. In the final table, Liverpool finished a full nine points adrift in second place, and Tottenham were an astonishing 15 points behind in third. Elsewhere in 1986-87, Sir Alex Ferguson took over at Old Trafford. Instead, Manchester United to a comfortable mid-table finish. 
Coventry City won their first ever major trophy, the FA Cup final at Wembley. Alan Ball led Portsmouth to promotion from the second division. And as ever, there was a sting in the tail for the Everton supporters when Howard Kendall left the club in the summer to try his luck in Spain with Athletic Bilbao. But that's another story. Everton were the champions again, there's no doubt about it. 1986-87 was a season to remember. Well, 22 teams dreamed of it in August. Maybe no more than half a dozen thought it was realistically possible, but only one team can enjoy this moment. Kevin Ratcliffe, as he did two years ago, will lead his team forward. Two trophies this year. Bobby Robson, the England manager there, will present the Today League sponsors memento. But the trophy on the right is the one that everybody's interested in. Philip Carter, the Football League chairman, will enjoy this moment more than most. Everton Football Club are the kings of English football. Well, not the most graceful lift of the trophy you've ever seen, but who cares about that? Kevin Ratcliffe proudly shows off the trophy. Graham Sharp, the season blighted by injury, but the ultimate prize, the ultimate cure. Dave Watson in his first season at the football club. Ian Snowden, another newcomer. Alan Harper, such a vital figure in the supporting cast. Trevor Stephen. Peter Reid, Adrian Heath there, and credit the late season contribution of Wayne Clark, his goals prove vital, Kevin Sheedy, the season of his life, Bobby Mims, an important figure during the early stages of the season, Paul Power, another who suffered during the campaign, as has Derek Mountfield. And last but not least, Neil Poynton. And as you reel off the names, you realise what a triumph it has been, not for 11 players, but for a whole squad. The squad which has proved itself once again to be the best in England. Howard Kendall has masterminded again. They've wrestled the trophy back from the grasp of the red half of Merseyside. It seems to be an almost annual game of pass the parcel. But Everton celebrate for the ninth time the capture of the Football League Championship. And have done it, of course, with room to spare as was the case two years ago some stylish football throughout the campaign the Goodison Park faithful have been able to witness the table doesn't lie after 42 games and Everton the cream of the crop well I suppose the speculation will go on and you'd wonder how this team would fare in European competition they won't obviously get that chance but the ultimate test in many ways the English first division in most people's eyes the hardest league in the world and this squad of players has delivered in style weathering the loss of Gary Lineker, whose 40 goals last season weren't enough to bring Everton a trophy, but without him, they've made that extra step. And joy unconfined around Goodison Park. Celebrations well, they look a little weary, but no wonder what a battle it has been. But Kevin Ratcliffe he 
who was contesting every trophy right to the end last season but didn't get his hands on any sort of silverware has another to add to the 85 title the 84 FA Cup and the 85 European Cup Winners Cup well they've certainly written their own chapter in this great club's history and they're getting used to this around Goodison Park Peter Reid he didn't enjoy as much of the campaign as he would have liked but he's certainly enjoying this moment right now other team in the country can enjoy what Everton are enjoying the Football League champions 1980